One of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me was piano lessons. Here's how the rule worked in the Maurer household. When we were about four or five years old, each of the boys, I was the oldest of three, developed a desire to play the piano. It was something that my father had done, music was always in the household, and it was something we wanted to be part of. And so my parents sat us down and they said, here's the rule. You can start playing the piano as long as you don't stop. Ever. And so, whereas many of my friends would start playing the piano or start an instrument somewhere in elementary school, they'd give it a shot, and if they didn't like it, they'd just stop doing it. When it got to the point where we wanted to stop because we'd rather go outside and play than sit down and take our lessons, do our practice, we didn't actually have a choice. We were in. And I can't tell you how valuable that is because so many times I would have quit. And now throughout my entire lifetime I've had the opportunity to better enjoy listening to music and also create it myself. Now, when a five-year-old starts playing the piano, it's nothing really special to behold. The attention span, the ability is just not quite there, and so they're plodding away, learning scales, boring stuff, but eventually, real songs start to be produced. The first thing that's important to be established for a new piano player is rhythm. That is making sure that the timing of the music is correct. That's the foundation of every piece of music. When I was a kid, we had this little contraption called a metronome. Now, I've got one on my Android phone here. I can set the timing, just put it up on the piano, and you can hear exactly where your timing is supposed to be. So if you start going too fast or too slow, this will keep you in line. And this is especially important because the most incredible or beautiful piece of music will sound horrible if it's not in time. After the student has a firm grasp on rhythm, melody is introduced. That's the piece of a song that makes you recognize it. It's that line that goes over the song that's recognizable, that would stick in your head, that makes that song unique. When music doesn't sound good, there's normally dissonance involved. That's the sound produced when two notes that are either too close to each other, the two notes that don't mesh well together, meet. That sound is dissonance, and it's not very pleasing to the ears. So as a musician, I tend to view many aspects of life through this lens. I'm looking for a consistent rhythm. I'm listening for a pleasant melody and I'm always looking for dissonance or discord in life. Now let's think about our financial lives through this musical lens for a moment. First, the rhythm. Money comes in, money goes out. Every household has this sort of cash flow rhythm where you're taking your income in and you're paying your bills every month. Whether your income comes in on a monthly basis, bi-weekly, quarterly, or even annually for some folks, you're still going to develop a form of a rhythm. Is it consistent in your life? Next, we have the melody. The melody in our financial lives is produced by the excess cash flow that we have over and above our bills that go in and out every month. We have the things in life that we want to be about. We put money towards them. Maybe it's investing, security for today, or planning for the future with your retirement, giving charitably, inviting people into your home and paying to have nice parties and gatherings where there's fellowship and people together. This is the melody that's created in our financial music, if you will. Finally, we have dissonance. Oftentimes, money is one of the primary points of discord in a relationship. They say that over 50% of marriages end in divorce. Over 50% of them claim that it's money issues. We find a lot of dissonance. Unfortunately, dissonance is often the primary or dominant theme in our financial music. Are you making financial music? How does it sound?